Thank you so much. It's really a profound honor to be here today. And I was in Little Rock about 12 years ago on a college road trip, but uh, I think things have probably changed a little bit since then, uh, so I've seen. Uh, so it's been a long week for me. I don't, I don't know about you all, but maybe we can start out with just a little bit Kenya Rwanda lesson, just to loosen things up. Uh, so uh, hello is Moraho, and Kenya Rwanda is the native uh, language of Rwanda. So hello is Moraho. Uh, Maraho. Uh, and then how are you is Amakuru, and the answer sometimes is Nimeza, which is good. Uh, so Mara, Maraho, Amakuru, Nimeza. <laughs> Excellent, me too, me too. Uh, so yes, my name is, is um, Ben Stone. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Indigo Africa. And Indigo Africa is a 501c3 nonprofit social enterprise that partners with for profit cooperatives of women artisans in Rwanda on a fair trade basis. And what we do is, is two different things that are very linked. Uh, we first work with these women, um, and they're their own separate for profit businesses. They're not part of Indigo Africa, they're our intimate business partners, which is a really important distinction. We work with them to design, market, export and then sell a wide variety of jewelry, accessories, uh, home decor uh, to uh, a number of uh, retailers in the U.S. on our online store, which is shop.indigoafrica.org, uh, which I encourage you to take a look at after this. Uh, we also do um, major design uh, collaborations with, with major brands such as Nicole Miller, Anthropology. J. Crew, Madewell, and lots of other trendy places that I've, I've never heard of, but apparently it's great that we're working with them. Uh, we then, Indigo Africa, the, the real innovation is not only uh, how we accomplish those, uh, the market access side, but we then pool all of our profits after covering fixed costs with donations. And we use those funds uh, to administer training programs that we've developed from the ground up for those same women in business management, entrepreneurship, literacy, and computers. And, uh, and all of those classes are taught by, uh, right now, I think 16 or 17 of the top university students in Rwanda. So it's a really a wonderful kind of circle of empowerment that we've got going on there. So our, our mission really is, I would say, twofold. It's uh, number one, um, to help these women access short-term and long-term income so they can feed their families and do all the other things that where in income is so important. Uh, but beyond that, it's to follow up with education so they can gain the skills and the information and confidence so, so they can be doing two different things. One is that so they can be parties of equal bargaining power across the table of other people who are coming into Africa to buy products. They can be empowered, hardcore negotiators, uh, which is very important. And the second, I would say, even more ambitious goal is that they can uh, become independent businesswomen. So as they become more sophisticated in the business realm, as they understand the export markets and, and what's happening, uh, they can begin to take over uh, roles that Indigo Africa currently uh, holds as the intermediary. Uh, and we've seen, uh, you know, that's a very, very uh, ambitious idea, but we've seen it come to fruition much quicker than we ever imagined, so it's very exciting. Um, the second more overarching goal of Indigo Africa is to really disrupt the conversation uh, about how nonprofits should operate, what fair trade means, and what this idea of social enterprise uh, is and what it can accomplish. And um, we're making some strides on that as well, and this is part of it, is having this conversation with, with people like you who are really interested uh, in learning more. Um, so uh, it was mentioned that I was a corporate lawyer. Um, so I'll, I think a, a, the first question is, how is it that a, uh, a pretty dorky, um, admittedly fashion challenged um, white male um, is now running a women's empowerment and fashion company in Africa? Uh, <laughs> and that's a good question. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the background and then I'll get uh, a little bit more into the structure of how Indigo Africa works and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll finish my, our little conversation today uh, just giving some of my thoughts about centri social enterprise more generally and maybe it can spark a conversation that we can then continue. So Indigo Africa started uh, with my very, very close friend from college named Matt Mitro. Uh, and Matt grew up off and on, off and on in Africa because his dad was an executive at Chevron. So he lived in Nigeria for a number of years and Angola for a number of years. And while there, he really saw the, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of African women artisans. Uh, and it really struck him that it wasn't, it wasn't talent, it wasn't drive that was holding them back. It was lack of access, and it, lack of access to two very specific things. Lack of access to export markets, 
and lack of access to education. And without those two things, they were really stuck with all of these skills and everything else, but couldn't power through. So that was something that just kind of always stuck with him. And uh, so we, we both graduated college, we both went to law school, we both went to, to uh, major corporate law firms. He was practicing project finance down in Washington, D.C., and I was doing corporate litigation here in New York. Um, and, you know, we took, in a lot of ways, it was the easy route, and we went about our business. Um, and uh, fast forward in about 2006, uh, Matt started having these conversations with myself and our friends and saying, listen, I have this idea. It's about linking the education and export markets and really helping these women, not through handouts, but through access and opportunity. And he just wouldn't be quiet about it. And so finally, a lot of us were, said, Matt, just go for it. And uh, you know, he really he took the leap, uh, and a leap that I, that I still am, am proud of and can't believe. And he quit his job and uh, went without pay for the next 18 months to really get Indigo Africa off the ground. And that meant digging into the most detailed things. So he did all of the uh, 501c3 applications and started building up policies and procedures and really started not from the fundraising side, which is where a lot of nonprofits start, but really about building the business infrastructure and the culture that would allow Indigo Africa to, to have a foundation upon which to scale successfully, efficiently, and responsibly. Uh, and so that was pretty cool. Um, so Matt was toiling away and uh, you know we were always talking about it and then in 2007 I brought Indigo African as my pro bono client at my, at my law firm called Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe in, in New York City. And I just got addicted. Uh, not only addicted to just the legal projects and getting people in the firm involved around the world, um, but also just this idea. And so I would work till 10 o'clock and then come home and work on the website with Matt until 3 in the morning and repeat the process, which was not uh, sustainable. Um, <laughs> and um, so in, two, in the summer of 2008, uh, Matt was going to go back to Rwanda to set up the training program portion of the business. And now, mind you, I'd never been to Rwanda or Africa, ever. Um, I'm from the middle of nowhere in Maine, so I really, uh, you know, it was a new experience for me. But, um, so I went to Rwanda with Matt, and uh, I was just blown away. And I was, I was blown away by two things. Um, one, the, the potential of this model and, and how different it was and how it was really changing the conversation about how an organization how organizations should be interacting with communities in Africa. And then even more than that were, were the women. I mean, these women were just incredible. They were funny and uh, just had so much energy and drive and all they really needed was that pathway. Um, so right then and there, I decided with Matt that I was gonna take a six month leave of absence from my law firm and uh, just help him get the business off the ground because it was, you know, it's pretty complicated. And uh, so I got back to my law firm and I approached the, a senior partner who I was familiar with and I knew that he knew what I was doing and had been to Africa. And I said, listen, I'm going to take six months off. Um, you know, I'm basically going to bankrupt myself, but, you know, that's cool. Life's short. And, um, but A, will Oric let me come back if that's what I decide I want to do? And B, is there anything that you guys can do to help, to help me out? Um, and amazingly, uh, Oric came back and they said, listen, why don't you go do this? And, and this is before the economy had its challenges too, so there were, the incentives were different then. Um, and I was billing a million hours a week. Uh, so they said, why don't you go do this full time for a year and we'll pay you uh, a small portion of your salary. And after I almost uh, fainted on the ground, I said, uh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, and the most significant thing about that, I think, was you know, people ask, why, why did Oric do that? And it wasn't because of PR. We were nothing. I mean, no one had ever heard of Indigo Africa. We had no money, nothing. It was still just this concept we were getting off the ground. And what it really was is they, they're a very progressive law firm that thinks about things a little differently. And what they were doing was making a venture capital investment in Indigo Africa, uh, just in a very unique, unique way. And um, so the short of it is, is that that relationship has just snowballed over the last four years to where I'm still technically an employee of Oric, even though I haven't practiced law for them for a long, long time. Um, and they have just completely brought Indigo Africa into the Oric family where we've had partners go to Rwanda and join our board of directors. And they, uh, we, our offices are within Oryx offices, uh, which is very nice. And we just, from, from the printing company that works for Oryx all the way to the CEO, it's just, they've really taken this in. And it's been a quite remarkable example of, of how corporations can, can work with nonprofits. So that's my story. Um, not as interesting as the other stories I hope to tell today, but I wanted to give people a little bit of background on that. Um, so the next question that often comes up is why Rwanda? Why would we, why would we choose Rwanda? And, in fact, Matt and his father um, came up with the Indigo Africa business model before they picked the country. 
And so they, they explored Angola, they, explain, they explored Nigeria, they explored a number of other countries. Um, but then they came across Rwanda, who introduced to them through a family friend from, from, um, from uh, Nigeria, uh, and uh, Angola, I'm sorry. And uh, it was really, it really struck to them for, for reasons which you, you may all know, which is that Rwanda, um, you know, it, it, it's, it rose from the genocide to become a shining continental star, star with policies prioritizing any corruption, relative ease of doing business, education, gender equality, uh, and it also had a, uh, a widely trained up population of artisans who were, who were amazingly talented but without export markets. So it really ended up being um, the ideal place to do business, and that's, that's held true uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, the next question we often get is why women? Why this focus on women? Um, and that's a whole other, I think, discussion, but the short answer is because women are awesome. Um, and they, uh, they are amazing business people, too. And, and so what we've seen in Rwanda is this combination of, of a few different things. Uh, one is the unfortunate effect of the genocide where a, 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 a high proportion of the men were, were killed, so there's a, women have to take on a stronger role. But also Rwanda's commitment to women. Um, you know, Rwanda has the highest percentage of, of women in parliament in the world at 50, 56%, which is really wonderful. And you see that trickle down a lot into how even families uh, work with women, where it's not that outrageous for the women to just be the head of household and, and run things. And you see that across the world, too. And that's why there is so much focus on, on women. Um, so that's, that's, those are a couple of questions um, that, to answer. And so now I'll just get a little bit into uh, both the market access side of Indigo Africa and then the, um, and then the training program side and uh, see if we can get into a little bit more detail. So we, Matt and I certainly had never run a business before. We had no idea about fashion or handicrafts or anything. Um, but we, what we did know, that, know is that these women were creating um, some amazing products, uh, particularly traditional baskets and some other textile products. And so uh, I, I believe it was about 2007, uh, Matt set out to build a brand. And so he took this fluorescent orange suitcase, stuffed it with products, and went to, I believe, 25 different cities across the US and would just roll in, you know, Willie Loman style into each, uh, into each store, uh, probably nine times out of ten being shown the door within about five seconds, um, but really stuck to it and uh, probably got into maybe 20, 25 stores, including the, um, the Art Institute in Chicago and the Holocaust Museum in D.C. and the Houston Holocaust Museum, places that really had a, had a you know, a very high-end clientele, but also really matched what Indigo Africa was trying to do. Um, so after we started to build a brand, uh, I think the real, I, the biggest innovation in a lot of ways of what Indigo Africa has done in this sphere is we then work to take, take it from a handicraft company to a fashion company. And what I mean by that is that we started off saying, hey store, do you want to buy this product because it's beautiful and it will help a woman? That to me is the handicraft model. And what we've evolved into is, is saying, hey, trendy major brands and stores, you should buy this product because it is hip and, and fashion forward, and it really hits the market that you're looking for for your particular clientele. And uh, we saw that kind of inflection point about a year and a half ago when we, when we were introduced to Nicole Miller, um, the, the, the famous designer, and we sat down with her, and she was originally just going to do like a, a charity event for us. And we said, well, That'd be great, but any interest in kind of co-designing a product with these women in Rwanda, because we can totally pull that off. And she was like, all right. Um, so what ended up, she writ, like, we brought her all the raw materials that they use. She riffed off like 10 designs, and we sent those designs to our team in Rwanda, who communicated those with the women. And then prototypes were then passed back and forth. So it was a real true co-design between Rwandan women and this awesome designer. And we came out with two products and they were like the hottest things in New York City. Uh, and suddenly we were in all the fashion magazines and things that we never dreamed before. And, and what that did was allow us to pivot. And then we built a blueprint about how to, how to work with, um, with places like that. So we've now integrated that into uh, J. Crew and anthropology. And so it's, uh, so J. Crew is a perfect example as a partnership we're going to be launching this year. Uh, so look out for it. It should, hopefully there's a J. Crew in, uh, in, in Little Rock that they'll be selling this, the bracelets at. But um, they said, this was about six to 10 months ago, they said, listen, this, here's, our, here's our vibe and our colors and our style for like spring, summer 2012. Like, how can you meet that market? So again, we worked back and forth probably six or seven times with prototypes and, and kind of came up with something. 
uh, that they really had a, you know, they had skin in the game now because they really had been involved in picking the product and knowing that there was something that was going to meet the market. And at the same time, the women started to understand what the market was asking for as well, which, which is really helping them move, move along that change. So uh, the other thing that we really try to do in the market access side is um, make sure that it, these are not lost leaders or one-off philanthropic partnerships with these major brands. So a lot of times they'll do an order with someone and they'll say, uh, this is great, but it'll, they'll take a loss and then it's on to the next thing. And what we really want is for, for organization, for brands to be not only reordering, but doubling and tripling their orders. Uh, and the way we do that is by delivering um, what, we, what we say we'll deliver, but m most importantly, making sure that every party along the supply chain is making a profit. From the women, of course, Indigo Africa, Sometimes the profits are not great, but they're there. And then I would say in a lot of ways, most importantly, that retailer is making a profit in some ways uh, in, a, in a similar way to a profit that they make in any order because that's the way that business is done and that's the way that it's done year on year. So, that, so we've really seen the success of that where, where retailers are making orders twice as big every year instead of just it kind of dissipating. So that's really, that's really uh, exciting. Um, the other way that we do it, like I, like I said before, is um, is building a solid supply chain. So we, um, we do all, we, for our e-commerce site, we do all of our warehousing at amazon.com. So it's all automatic, it's all scalable. And we really have focused a lot on customs and logistics um, and quality control. And the women all have their own quality control panels and then uh, they sign off on stuff and then our team in Rwanda signs off on it. So they really are, are being integrated into that process. Um, so really just being able to nail difficult orders. I mean, we've had to, uh, since there's no yarn manufacturers in Rwanda, we've had to import up to three to 5,000 kilos of yarn from Turkey and China into Rwanda. And I have to tell you, it's really hard. Um, but we've pulled it off so far, uh, and it's been great. And finally, on the market access side is, is fair trade, um, which is really important. And, I, and I'll say here that, you know, I think that the idea of fair trade has been diluted in a lot of ways. Um, fair trade is not just buying and selling from, from poor or developing communities, and I think that's how it's looked at a lot. Fair trade is there's a very specific criteria that, uh, that companies need to follow to be fair trade. It's um, really working off of a living wage for the women and making sure that that's what they're getting paid for their services. Um, and uh, sharing of the commercial risks. So we pay the women 50% in advance of production, and then 50% when the products are delivered to us in Rwanda. And that's a lot more equitable than saying you get the remaining 50% when it's, say, sold in the U.S. That's not, that, that doesn't work well for women. Um, so, that's, so that's that side of the company. The other side is the training programs. And um, the training programs are, in a lot of ways, my favorite part, uh, because I understand education a little bit more than I understand fashion. Um, and so our training programs cover a variety of different areas. Uh, um, but the most important is business management, um, because that's all about how they can run their for-profit businesses better. So we get into record keeping, budgeting, pricing, payments, banking, governance, government licensing. And you know, once a particular cooperative starts to grasp these principles and move along that spectrum of sophistication, um, the curriculum moves to more entrepreneurial stuff. So market analysis, trends, pricing, profit margins, shipping, contracts, business communications, public relations, marketing, every, you know, business, business school. Um, and it's really cool And that as they become more sophisticated, the idea is that they'll be taking some of those steps along the supply chain off of Indigo Africa's plate and becoming more integrated into that supply chain. And that's, that's true success. And the idea really for Indigo Africa is to put ourselves out, out of business as it relates to each cooperative. And as we do so, and our bandwidth frees up, we then move on to other cooperatives who are starting from more difficult circumstances. And that is something that's, that's been happening, although it is a long game. This is not a one or two year project. It is a decades long project and everyone is in it for the long term. Um, we also, Generation Rwanda is an international NGO that we work very close with. Um, they provide scholarships for um, some of the more socially vulnerable young students in Rwanda to go to university. And these are like the tip top students. I mean, I think they accept like 1% of their applicants. And so they've already done the vetting and then we accept applications from them. And the, those are the students who teach our training programs. And it's been a wonderful thing. We do a lot of mentoring um, and uh, career development and, how, and also training of the trainers. So how adult adult learning, you know, how do you teach older women um, stuff, half of whom are illiterate. Um, and then also p participatory learning. You know, Rwanda is moving away from this, but it used to be very rote memorization education system. So we're, we do lots of uh, exercises and, you know, they do lots of skits and back and forths and 
uh, the women do presentations, and you know they love it because there's lots of laughter and and, uh, and integration. Um, we've also last year with our education programs developed an incredible partnership with Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program. And what they do is uh, they, they provide scholarships around the world in developing countries for women to enter the local academic institution and have basically a six month expedited MBA program. And the wonderful thing about our partnership with them is that our training programs are meant to, to help women who are starting from very difficult circumstances kind of make their way through the equivalent of like elementary school, junior high, and then, and then high school. But, you know, we can only do so much. And so these, these top women leaders who are kind of just cruising through our programs now have the ability to go and get the equivalent of a university and business school education, um, which has been awesome. Uh, so some of the strategies that we've used for, um, for our success and for our kind of disruption, I would say, uh, number, the first and foremost that I alluded to before is, is business infrastructure and you know, really spending a lot of time on business systems, whether it's the supply chain, uh, institutionalizing decision making, creating policies and procedures, and really just thinking of ourselves as a Fortune 500 company, um, which unfortunately we're not quite yet, um, but, but, really, but really using that idea of this is a business more than anything else. Like you will never hear me say like we're a charity. I, I barely even say we're a nonprofit because I think of us like a business that just happens to be driving social impact. Um, the other very important thing that we focus on is transparency, and that's another way that we really want to um, show by example what transparency can mean, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's uh, a good business strategy and programmatic strategy. So, you know, in the U.S. side, you can go onto our website and read all of our corporate and financial documents, um, which is quite unusual. Um, but in the, it's even more important, I would say, on the Rwanda side, which is that we're an open book to all of our business partners, these women in Rwanda, so they can see every step of the supply chain. They can see our pricing analysis. And, that, and, that, and through that, they can understand how those things work so they can start to, excuse me, take over a lot of this stuff. So it's very, very important. And then I'd say third is, um, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there that talk about social impact and how they're driving forward women's empowerment. And I think it's wonderful, but it's very important to verify social impact so that those claims do not become diluted. So that's something that we focused on quite a bit from the very beginning is conducting annual social impact assessments and issuing reports and also putting all of the, the raw data online so people can tell us that, you know, if we're doing a good job or not. And it's, you know, that's very difficult to do social impact assessment. Um, it's hard to find objective standards upon which to, 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 um, to base your measurement and um, just it's, it takes a ton of uh, bandwidth. And, you know, for a scrappy little company like us who's getting bigger um, and who's competing a lot with in the for-profit space, that in a lot of ways it's a competitive disadvantage. Um, but we like to think of it as a competitive advantage in terms of driving social, real social impact. And I think people these days, um, which I'll get into before, really care about that stuff and they want to hear that it's just not, you're not just talk, you're backing it up. Um, so speaking of uh, social impact, Indigo has seen uh, some tremendous impact. I mean, we've seen, these women have earned thousands of dollars in sales revenue and experienced dramatic improvements in their lives. I mean, we're talking more meals eaten per day, more of their kids in school, more savings, better access to running water. And, you know, with, with steady income and, and previously unattainable education, they're really fulfilling their destiny to hold up half the sky, which is a, a term that I'm sure you've all heard and it's just so important. Um, one example that I want to talk about is a woman, her name is Emilianne Niramana. Uh, Emilianne um, survived the, the horrors of the genocide um, in 1994. At the time, she was a senior secondary student and uh, she lost countless family members and friends and, and as she, she rebuilt her life and started a family, she resolved to start a business, but because of her lack of business education, she struggled. And by 2006, she was walking dozens of kilometers a day carrying water for 25 cents. Um, but Amelia Ann, if you've met her, you'll, you'll know she never gives up, uh, ever. And she saved her money and in 2007 took a sewing course and joined a women's sewing um, association called Ange. Um, and this is, I want to tell a little story because I think this really encapsulates the idea of Indigo Africa. Um, and this is the first moment where I was like, whoa, this works. Um, so Ange's leadership, um, was proving itself problematic and in some ways corrupt. And uh, so some of the women uh, came to Indigo Africa and they said, can you intervene and, and fix this for us? And you know, rather than entangling ourselves in, a, in a, another business's uh, internal conflicts, uh, what, we did, what we decided to do instead was expedite some of our training programs. So for instance, cooperative law, voting rights, governance. 
um, because we knew, and they, I think they knew too, that it was time for these women to take control of the trajectory of their own business. Um, so into this vortex uh, stepped Emilianne, and uh, you know, I first met Emilianne in 2008, and she was swat, uh, shy and quiet, but there was something there, and I was like, this woman is going places, and uh, this was her moment. And so Emilianne marshaled support, uh, member support to dissolve Ange, and uh, with, the, with the members who were not involved in some of these wrongdoings, uh, formed a new cooperative called Kokoki, and uh, committed themselves to transparency and ethics. And, but, but Emilianne didn't stop there. She, during the Kokoki's elections, uh, this is a very George Washington moment, I think, uh, she could have easily risen to the presidency, um, or however you want to put it, the royalty of the cooperative. And instead, she really encouraged the uh, members to focus on a candidate's technical qualifications when casting their vote, not family history or anything else like that. And, and what, what happened then is that Kokoki and those women embraced probably for the first time in their lives uh, the concept of meritocracy. And I think that that was the moment they realized with this access and with their confidence they could really accomplish anything. Um, so over the next three years, um, because of their own drive and through partnership with Indigo Africa, Kokoki has taken off to be one of the most uh, coolest and, and most interesting and, and uh, in inspirational businesses in Rwanda. Um, they, uh, you know, Nicole Miller visited them in October and executed the first purchase order ever directly between a major brand and a cooperative uh, without Indigo Africa or any other intermediary in the middle. Um, so that was really amazing. You know, Emilianne learned English in like six months. Um, so between times that I visited, suddenly she was fluent in English. Um, and that was partly through her own drive she was doing on the side and partly through Indigo Africa's training programs. Um, and then, of course, in, in July 2010, Emilianne was accepted into the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women program. Um, you know, I think, she'd, I think it was one spot, uh, one of 25 spots out of probably five or 600 applicants. Um, but we never had any doubt that, that she was getting in. Um, and she really just, she, she did an incredible job. And at her graduation, Kokoki's president, um, Jacqueline, uh, I love this quote, proudly proclaimed that Emilianne won the certificate because of her bravery. Despite the challenges in her family and life, Emilianne thought not of the present, but of the future, and uh, I, I just, I think that says so much. And uh, so this past October, um, we actually brought Emilianne and her colleague, um, Therese, uh, who also was ex uh, accepted and I think is graduating next week from the 10,000 program, 10,000 women program, in addition to one of our Generation Rwanda trainers who made his way through our program and then graduated and we hired as a full-time employee, um, Eve, uh, we brought them to the US and that's the first time that we did that and we just had a crazy awesome time, uh, exhausting but amazing, uh, where we had panel events at Goldman Sachs and NYU and Oregon and we had a private tour of the White House and met with the State Department and saw the Empire State Building and went to see The Lion King on Broadway, um, spent three full days at Nicole Miller Studios where they just were totally integrated into the business, design, sewing, everything. And it was really a, a remarkable, remarkable moment. Uh, but the social impact of, on Indigo Africa, you know, that's a great example of like the highlight, but Sometimes it's, it's smaller than that too, but in, in a grandiose way, which is that there's one cooperative that we work with called Abasingie. And Abasingie is a group of women who uh, really uh, had terrible things happen to them during the genocide and are still very, very much struggling with it. Um, uh, you know, so for them, it's, it's not necessarily about coming to the US and, and becoming the place of Milian is it's finding a new kind of vision and confidence and hope for the future. And, uh, you know, for instance, three members of Abbas and Gye, um, told us that before our literacy training started that they didn't even know how to hold a pen. And now they know how to read and write and um, they feel especially proud to, to write their names or enter a bank and feel confident. You know, that's very, that's not something that's common in Rwanda, which is a very poor woman to enter a bank and know how to do the banking. So it's like, those are things that I think are really important from, from the other side of things. So Indigo Africa, where are we now? We, um, we're taking the, the last steps, I would say, from a scrappy startup to um, a real permanent and institutional player in this marketplace. And, um, you know, it really started with a grassroots movement. It started with my friends and Matt's friends from WashU, um, where we went to university, um, and then kind of has built up into this real movement um, of people behind this market-driven, business-minded approach. And uh, the, mo the most interesting thing that I think has happened is that when Indigo Africa started, and for the first couple of years, it was always market demand here, and then production capacity here. These were our, our cooperative partners. 
And so we didn't want to scale the number, the, the training programs to more women until we knew that there was going to be a corresponding market demand for their businesses, because the whole idea is that they're linked. And so we really, you know, there are arguments to be made that we could, that we could and should have scaled it, but philosophically we decided that this is how indographical roles were going for it. We just needed to build a market demand. Um, and now that we've done that, we're seeing market demands here and production capacities here. So now we're spending a ton of time bringing in all of these new talented women into our programs um, to produce uh, and also scaling our, our training program. So as much as I always talk about Indigo Africa being a market-driven organization, now we are truly a market-driven organization. The market is demanding that we scale, and we scale our, our, the number of women, and we scale our impact. So it's a very, very exciting moment. So, this, I know this all sounds great, but I don't want to lead you to believe that there have not been a ridiculous amount of challenges involved in, in building Indigo Africa and running it. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's really like running a number of different businesses at one. It's a, in one, it's wholesale, retailer, business school, nonprofit. You know, there's a reason why. I, you know, I may see ener seem energetic right now, but inside, I just want to kind of go to sleep because all we do is work and and just power through on this stuff, and it's pretty incredible. Um, but you know, there's been a lot of uh, challenges. One is just human capital. You know, at the very beginning and until very re recently, we relied on a lot of young people um, making a huge personal and financial sacrifices to work with us. Um, and that's wonderful, but it's not the way that you recruit and retrain, re uh, retain long-term employees who are part of a real business. Um, so that's one thing that we're really doing right now is taking, making that shift into paying people market rates and getting a healthcare plan and doing things that a business does. So, uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, the training programs are also a challenge to figure out what, what works and what doesn't. So everything about Indigo Africa is a constant and transparent excuse me, and candid communication with the women. So really finding out what's working. And uh, you know, so there's a lot of women who just want the basic programs and it's part of their day, but it's not the most important thing. Um, there are other women who are leaders and they want to just keep on going strong. And so we're trying to figure out how to balance those things within our bandwidth. Uh, you know, we have typical small business challenges. When, it, when we have to do a purchase order that requires Indigo Africa, you know, paying the women in advance and in some cases purchasing the raw materials in advance, we have to end up putting thousands and thousands of dollars up front on purchase orders that we're not getting paid on until, you know, 10, 12 months later sometimes. So it's really, you know, small business liquidity challenges. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the most interesting challenges that we face is this constant um, tension that I don't think will ever go away between the social and the enterprise of the social enterprise model. I mean, if, for example, a, uh, you know, a brand may come to us and say, we love this product, here's the price, we can't go any higher for it for all of these reasons. Um, we may look at our costs and say, well, Indigo Africa doesn't make any profit off this, in fact, we might take a loss. But on the other hand, these women in Rwanda are gonna make a killing off of this. And so we always, we have to really think about what, are, what is Indigo Africa? Are we a business that has a social impact side of it? Or are we an NGO that's, that's using business to drive forward what we're doing? Um, so there's no good answer and we're constantly grappling with that quite honestly. And it, and it changes as the business changes and as, uh, and as everything changes. So it's, it's constantly, it's, it's very interesting. So, you know, Indigo Africa I, I feel like illuminates the, the potential for social enterprise in the most challenging of social contexts. And you know, for me it's not only about celebrating the past but also the future. I mean, these are women who are reclaiming control over their futures. They're, you know, they have the opportunity to translate their experiences of financial security and confidence into a lasting self, uh, sense of self-worth and pride. And that goes so much further, I think, than, than your traditional handout. And the impact really doesn't stop with the artisans either. It's a, it's, uh, you know, they're investing in the future of Rwanda, where these women are going home and they're teaching their kids what they've learned each day. And, uh, and the kids are seeing that education is uh, sometimes different and can lead to things that they didn't, they'd never imagined. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing where everyone is being lifted up. Um, so that's my, that's my spiel about Indigo Africa a little bit. And, and now I want to kind of get into a little, um, some thoughts about this, this idea of social enterprise and what it means. And um, I'll talk about a few different things. And I don't know how it'll, where it'll lead, but maybe it'll lead to a good conversation. So as you know, there's been a, a rising kind of criticism of public or government funded um, aid and aid distribution. Uh, over the last probably five to, to seven years, and, and many are arguing that traditional aid is often wasteful and, and irrelevant and, and inefficient. And you know, Bill Eastry, the famous economist, is arguing that, as, as many others, that, that aid is failing because it can't think and act like a business. And I think there's a lot of uh, truth to that. As, you know, 
as much as there are certain aid programs that are incredible and wonderful and necessary, I think that there, there can be this better focus. And there's a variety of combination of social change models who are responding to this demand. Um, you know, one reaction is the rise of this, uh, the citizen consumer um, who's demanding that social and environmental change um, via individual acts of conscious consumption. And I really like that idea. Uh, but it's, it's, in some ways, it's becoming diluted as well. You know, for instance, there's uh, one strategy popula uh, popularized by the Red Campaign, for instance, is to co-brand and sell commercial products manufactured somewhere and then donate a portion of the proceeds to additional aid organization helping people somewhere else. And, um, you know, I think this is, a, this is actually a wonderful model in many ways because it helps raise funds for tough but noble causes that are suffering because of this giving backlash. Uh, for example, $100 million, $180 million um, was raised through the Red Campaign and donated to the Global Fund, which, is, which addresses AIDS in Africa. And that's money that probably wouldn't have come in through traditional giving. So that's huge. Um, but there's a, there's, a certain there's a certain way that it's um, mixing the conversation up a little bit. So for instance, Bono, uh, Bono distinguished Red from philanthropy by saying that philanthropy is like hippie music, holding hands. Uh, and red is more like uh, punk rock, punk rock, hip hop that should feel like hard commerce. Um, now, I, I think I know what he's getting at with hard commerce, and that when instead of just sending a check to the global fund, you're buying something, and um, so it's it's donating through commerce, and 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 that's really what something like the red campaign is. Uh, it it doesn't feel like much like ph philanthropy because you're buying something, but it's really just um, a different financing mechanism f for aid, and it's branded differently. You know, hence you hear the the term uh, brand aid, um, which I would call it. And, but what it doesn't do is uh, address the systemic challenges in commerce as it affects the, the developing world. And it focuses instead on beneficiaries who are not related to supply chains, producers, or the end product. Um, so again, there's huge value to these initiatives, but the general misconceptions is diluting the real point, I think, of conscious consumerism. And I think that point really is um, making sure that there's direct contact and understanding between the consumer and the producer, and making sure that that understanding is uh, understanding the whole integration of the supply chain from, from the beginning to the end. Uh, and there are a variety of different organizations doing that. There's one I've heard of called Indigo Africa um, that I think is doing a great job. Um, you know, one, one particular way that we like to really make sure that the, cons the customer is directly um, in contact with the artisan is um, that each one of our products has a hang tag that's signed by the artisan. And you can go onto our website and you can see which, the, a photo of the woman, and you can see the cooperative and you can learn more about what she's doing. And uh, that's a real connection of like, I know who made this product. Um, uh, even if it's one of 10,000 that's being sold to J. Crew, you can drill down and know the woman who made your product. And I think there's something really special and unique about that. Um, there's also someone who spoke here just last, just last, um, Last month, um, Patrick Woodyard is doing some great stuff with shoes that I, that I really appreciated hearing about. There's a company called Vision Spring that's, um, that's providing eyeglasses and eyeglass entrepreneur kits around the world. And we partner with them to get uh, a lot of our artists and partners eyeglasses, which for someone whose biggest fear is getting stuck without his contacts or glasses um, on a deserted island, that's, uh, that's a big deal. Um, you know, and there are other companies who are connecting in a better way, um, producers and uh, retailers. There's a company called Supply Change that we've really um, started to love and, and worked with. Um, but you know, most importantly along this, along this change, the most important thing to be a, being a conscious consumer is asking tough questions. Um, just really asking tough questions and demanding transparency. Because there are a lot of organizations out there who are talking about fair trade, talking about empowerment, but it's the consumer's obligation to ask the questions and drill down whether that's actually true or not. Because if it's not true, it's taking away um, resources and funds from other organizations where it may be true. Um, you know, as a quick aside, uh, you know, as you know from Indigo Africa, we believe that access to markets is, is not enough in a lot of circumstances, particularly in the, in the most vulnerable um, communities. And so we really think education must be a part of that. And we're seeing a lot of big companies these days, uh, I like to think following Indigo Africa's lead, but uh, that may be a little ambitious. Um, for instance, uh, American Express. Um, American Express Open focuses a lot on small businesses domestically. Um, in a lot of ways, women own small businesses. And by, by providing you know, a lot of unique tools and, and useful information for these businesses, um, and then following up um, with an education component in marketing and finance and technology, they're really driving, driving up uh, small businesses in the US. And you know, if that's not social enterprise, I, I don't really know what is um, in a lot of ways. You know, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program and the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Business Program 
are doing a lot of the same things. Uh, you know, and the point here is that particularly with commerce, trade, you know, they have the saying, you know, trade not aid, but the idea is that trade can in fact be aid if you're not following up with, with the education, with the ability for these producers to become part of that supply chain. So where if this intermediary, intermediary leaves, they won't be left um, from where they started because that in a lot of ways is just handing out something. You have to leave them with the ability to do that themselves. Um, um, my, my, my next point is a little bit different and I'm moving away from ethical consumerism and, and pushing the idea of doing business with instead of doing business for. And there's a, a famous academic, um, his name is C.K. Prahalad, and he argues that uh, big multinational companies should enter and invest in the world's poorest markets, uh, you know, stimulating commerce and development at the, at the bottom of the economic pyramid. And, and this squares with uh, Bill Easterly's um, idea of opportunistic um, innovation model that looks for targets of innovation, not just long range rigid goals by donor agencies. And this squares with my own one of my favorite terms, which is like looking for bright spots. You know, it's not looking for things that are wrong and trying to fix them, it's looking for things that are right and trying to build off of them. It's one of the things I, it's not directly related, but I love it. Um, and uh, so the idea is that, you know, there are 65% 60, of the world's population earns less than $2,000 each year. That's, you know, 4 billion people at least. And a lot of people think that this is not an obvious area of opportunity because, uh, you know, general assumptions are about there are barriers to commerce like corruption, no one has any money, literacy, inadequate infrastructure, bureaucracy. Um, but I think a lot of those assumptions are incorrect actually. And for example, it's assumed that goods are, are, are sold for very cheap prices in poor communities and thus there's no room for competitors to come in and turn a profit. Uh, and in reality, costs are actually much higher in these kind of communities, sometimes 20 to 30 percent more in the poorest communities. So for instance, I was reading um, uh, that like there's a shanty town of more than one million people in Mumbai, and for them, decent water costs about a dollar 12 per cubic meter, and just not too far from there in an upper class community, it costs three cents per cubic meter. Uh, cubic meter. And the same goes for di diarrhea medication and lots of other products. So there is a lot of room for big companies to provide basic goods and services that reduce costs to the poor and help improve the standard of living while also uh, generating an acceptable return on investment. And I think that there's a lot of, lot of opportunities there. Not only, not only that, but by becoming more efficient and learning how to enter those communities, um, these companies can discover creative ways to configure their products and finances and supply chains to increase productivity across the board. It does not just in, their, in these developing communities. Um, so my last point about this is taking an even more global perspective uh, and asking what is social entrepreneurship anyway? And my feeling is, is that uh, social entrepreneurship is great. Uh, is be the, the term is great because it's provided an incentive for people to think differently and act differently and, and motivation. But in reality, I just, I think it's almost meaningless. And, and what I mean by that is that I think the discussion over social entrepreneurship often focuses too much on the motivation or the spark or the innovation and not as much on the impact, the consequence. And, you know, so for example, there are tons of businesses out there driving forward massive global social impact while focusing almost exclusively on their bottom line. Uh, you know, Google is a great example. Their, their motivation in some areas is to lay the ground for profit in 20 years from now or 30 years from now or 100 years from now. But in the short term, they're driving incredible, incredible social impact. Uh, you know, for instance, they have this the, uh, new program in Africa called Google Trader, which is a very low bandwidth way for people in several African countries to use the web and, uh, and SMS to buy and sell products, services, get jobs, everything. And it's really, a, it's really allowing people to engage the marketplace in a better way than they've ever been able to before. Um, you know, uh, Matt Mitro, who I, I talked about before, the founder of Indigo Africa, uh, about a year ago left to join Google in London. He's now the university program specialist for Africa and the Middle East. And his job is all about this kind of long-term social impact. He is the ambassador between Google and all the academic institutions in Africa and the Middle East. And what he's doing is building that human capacity, uh, human, human capacity and human capital helping recruit the, the top students there, and then also working with Google to um, develop and upgrade infrastructure at these schools, whether it's bandwidth or anything else. And that's not, you know, his mandate is not to get profits for Google, it's to just build this infrastructure. And that's playing the long game, and that's playing a, a market-driven long game, which I really uh, appreciate. And then to even, not to use Google as this example, but I think they are a good example, but like Eric Schmidt just the other day wrote, or, or, or said that, you know, well, while Google only employs about 30,000 people around the globe, 
you know, which is a fraction of places like Caterpillar or Boeing, uh, they've indirectly generated millions of additional jobs and trillions of dollars in wealth by offering up a valuable platform for commerce to, to more efficiently work. And I think that's really important. And again, if that's not social enterprise, I don't know what is. That to me, that fits the idea of social enterprise. You know, even Facebook even more is even more indirect. Their whole, their whole mission, and you can see that in their IPO filing yesterday, they make a point of it. Um, you know, there may, they may have other reasons for doing that, but the idea is that Facebook is all about the social mission. You know, it's also about a lot of money these days, um, but it's about opening uh, the world and making it a more connected place. In a lot of ways, that can drive more social impact than any of the other kind of social enterprises that you think of more traditionally. Um, you know, and this can, you know, this kind of idea of social enterprise can be analogous to the transcontinental railroad or the cotton gin or Henry Ford, and you know, and that's kind of what I, I think about a lot and, and what I think is really exciting way to look at it. Um, so, in conclusion. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, particularly students, like, that sounds great, Ben, but what, what advice do you have for us? And so I have two pieces of advice um, that I've mostly gained from the women in, in Rwanda, actually. Um, the first one is get nerdy. And, <laughs> and, and I mean that in the best way possible. Uh, and and what, what I mean by that is uh, two different things. One is really dig down and learn hard skills. And this is particularly, I think, relevant to the school and that, like, I think the best way possible to leverage this incredible education is also to you know, learn to ha how to read financial statements and accounting and become a strong and powerful writer and communicator. And that way you'll be able to translate everything that you've learned into uh, results in I think a much different way. Um, the other is to just embrace and curiosity. You know, it's something that I, I actually, I think I have a problem with it that I stay up late reading textbooks sometimes, um, which is just, you know, it's just really unfortunate. <laughs> um, but the idea, <laughs> but the idea is, is that like it, you just have to embrace it because that's where you grow every day and really get into spheres that you never could have imagined and and, and excel in them. Um, the other, the other kind of lesson learned I, I learned um, from Emilienne, Emilienne actually, is I, I asked her one day, you know, what's your what's the secret to overcoming so so many enormous obstacles, and. She smiled at me and with her wry, you know, little smile, and she said, Ben, you have to stand bold. And what I love about that is it just encapsulates everything that she's done, and I think a lot of ways that Indigo Africa's grown, which is that, you know, Amelianne, she's not afraid of fail failures or setbacks. She's been through more than I could ever even imagine. Um, but she's had a goal all along, and she pushes it forward with confidence, uh, conviction, and thoroughness. And, and because of that, uh, people step up and stand bold with her. And I just think it's a, a wonderful thing. So thank you all for having me here. And thank you all for uh, standing bold with Indigo Africa and everyone else that's trying to push forward a, a new way of thinking about uh, social enterprise and, and markets. Thank you, Ben. We do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Mark, we'll come to you next. Hi, my name is Matt Lyon. I'm a first year student at the Clinton School. Thank you very much for coming. I've got two questions. Uh, the first is, do you need help this summer? <laughs> and number two, I'm just curious a little bit more about um, how you develop the cooperatives, if this is more of a, the women doing it, or do you come in and kind of cultivate that and the management of the cooperative itself? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, the first question is yes. We always have internships, so talk to me after. Um, second is, I, I love that question because it, it's, it allows me to hammer home the idea that these are separate, independent, for-profit businesses. So the idea is that Indigo Africa really prefers um, not to partner with groups of women who haven't already shown the intent um, to work together and, even better, already formed themselves into a cooperative, which is actually a technical corporate form in Rwanda. Uh, we've had, there's one exception, um, this group called Abasingye, and that's, you can read about them on our website, and there's good reason why we helped them form as a cooperative. Um, but otherwise, we really, we don't like, we don't want to be the NGO that comes into a, a community and says, hey, all of you random women, you should be running a business together, because that's not how business ever works. Um, and, it, and I don't think it's a way of, of helping these women in the long term. Mark. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being with us. My name is Mark Peters, and I'm also a student here at the Clinton School. Um, my question is, it seems like part of what makes you sustainable is that you've found a way to bring in income as opposed to donations. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those two different models of running a nonprofit, like generating income versus trying to fundraise all the time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's a lot more time consuming because <laughs> um, we really are focusing both. And, and like I said, what Indigo Africa does is we use the, the profits generated or the revenue generated from, from the market access side to cover all of our fixed costs. So that's raw materials, paying the artisans, shipping, um, a bunch of other stuff, and in part an allocation of the employees' salaries who are focused on that stuff too. And then we have that chunk that's then left over sometimes um, that we pool with donations. So we really are focused on these two things. And, and one thing I'll say is that I think in terms of uh, making a case why we're a really great investment on the philanthropy side is that someone can make an investment in us and it's not just education component. There's already a working and profitable economic development program going on already. It's just, uh, it's just um, adding on to that. Hi, thanks so much for coming. So you mentioned that in the early days of Indigo Africa, the business plan was written without even the country having been chosen. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about transitioning from having a generic business plan into having one that's actually working on the ground. And if you were surprised by any of the things that you found once you actually got to Rwanda that didn't really coalesce with the business plan you had written. Sure. Well, I would just, I'll say broadly that you can write the best business plan possible, um, but it's, I mean, it probably will be 20% reality once you hit the ground, if that. Uh, people ask me all the time, like, well, what do you do every day exactly? Uh, and my answer uh, is usually, I just hustle. I mean, I'm just constantly hustling, whether it's for sales, fundraising, or to deal with lots of other logistical problems. And I think that's the mindset that you have to have when you're taking a business plan into reality is just knowing that it is gonna, you're just going to be stepping into a vortex of craziness um, and just being flexible enough and nimble enough um, to be able to deal with it. And that brings me back to my, the idea of getting nerdy um, because I think unless you can really dig in and get nerdy on this stuff, it's very challenging to be able to deal with the, the multitude of things that are thrown at you. Last one, Hillary. Hi, I'm Hillary. I'm also a student here. Thank you for being here. Um, I know this might be a long-term goal, but have you thought about expanding to other countries in Africa? And if so, where? And <laughs> not even Africa, but the world. Um, yeah, I mean, Indigo Africa was built from the very beginning, not only um, in terms of a company built to last just in Rwanda, but to put in that infrastructure so we could essentially copy and paste it into other countries in Africa, hence the Indigo Africa. Um, but uh, you know, it is a long-term goal. I, we thought that we were going to be able to do it faster than we than is, is true, um, and uh, I don't think we'll I don't think we'll look to expand for at least a couple of years unless someone says, "Here's a million dollars. We would like you to expand into a country." Um, primarily because we haven't reached our economy of scale yet in Rwanda. There are still a, a number of artisans there who are trained up and ready to roll, um, and if we have the market demand and the infrastructure already in place, um, particularly in a country like Rwanda, that's really been helpful. Like there wouldn't be any real business reason why we would go to another country. And as you know, like, there would have to be a business reason for us to do it. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming to the Clinton School, and thank you all for coming out today. Thank you.